Liquid democracy. What is it? Who has invented it? What's with the word liquid in the name? Has it been implemented already somewhere? And if so, where? Now, there's a lot of questions people have when they encounter the buzzword liquid democracy. And let me give you a couple of answers. Let's maybe first start with the what. You see, some people think of liquid democracy as this form of delegated voting where you can make other people to vote on your behalf by topics such as education, healthcare, you know, and stuff like that. Now, the reason for this assumption is that a German party has actually used it in that way for a small period of time. But liquid democracy is way more than that. The idea itself is incredibly simple. There are three basic principles to it. First, any member of a society can delegate its political power to any other member of the same society. Second, any delegation of power can at any time be revoked. And third, all the delegations are transitive. Now, what does that mean? The first principle means that you do not need to bother with actively participating in decision making. You can delegate your power to whoever you trust, and then you basically just stay out of the whole game. The second principle means that you can re-enter this game at any time you want. This means you never actually give away your political power as you otherwise would do with elections. And the third principle means that the power accumulates. The power which others delegate to you is then automatically delegated further. Liquid democracy is an incredibly powerful way how we can assure that actually everybody can participate in decision making without the need for elections and without the need for representatives. And you can do literally everything through liquid democracy, what you would usually expect from elected representatives, like you can pass laws, you can create public policies, you can do public funding, you can empower individuals to assume societal roles, like to become mayor, to become judge, to become public official. And all this brings us to the next question. Who actually invented this incredible thing? The honest answer is nobody. Now, this might surprise you, because if you deal already with this topic, you Google around a bit, you will find that, for example, this guy who wrote Alice in Wonderland is rumored to have proposed something close to liquid democracy. But that's not true. And there's quite a number of other names that pop up in discussions on the origins of liquid democracy. You have guys coming from economics, you have guys coming from political science. Now, fact is that quite a number of people have come independently up with ideas on new forms of democracies. Actually, all those names you might find floating around are to a certain degree irrelevant. Because the question is not who taught it up, the question is who did it. And let me explain you why. You see, liquid democracy is something that can be realized only by means of technology as it has been created during the late 20th century. You cannot do liquid democracy without software. You cannot do it without cryptography. You cannot do it without telecommunication. And most importantly, you cannot do it without the guy who has the motivation, who has the time, and who has the skills to actually build something complex as that. And these kind of guys are extremely rare. Michelangelo had the vision of helicopters flying around in the world. He was putting in some thoughts of how a helicopter might look like, but he did not invent the helicopter. Lominosov and Sikorsky did it many centuries after Michelangelo's sketches. So let's give kudos to the pioneers who didn't just have a vision, who didn't just have an idea, but who actually did something. Michael Allen's Motorola is the first system of which there is evidence that it implemented the three principles of liquid democracy. Motorola started in 2007, and it was a pretty generic system which allowed the community to deliberate online, to delegate votes, and to ultimately make political decisions. By 2014, the guys who have been working on Motorola have given up on the project, and sadly there is no evidence that it would have ever been used by any organization for real. In 2008, yours truly developed the system Jupa. Jupa was a liquid democracy system for governing the emerging student union of the faculty where I was teaching back then. And Jupa 
enabled its members to apply for something like, for example, for funding of their project idea or for support in their ambition to become the president of the organization and, or to be any other high ranked member which usually gets elected. Now, these applications would be posted anywhere on the web in a special machine readable format. Once then the application received enough support through the Liquid Democracy Network, the applicant would instantly have gained the right they applied for. Unfortunately, the environment in which Jupa was set was way too conservative. The student union itself was established in 2010, but the system, likewise, was never used for real. At about the same time, the German Pirate Party commissioned their own liquid democracy system, Liquid Feedback. Liquid Feedback is the only system of which we know that was used for actually a longer period of time. The German Pirates, they used it from 2010 to 2015. And what's really cool about this case is that there is substantial amount of academic publications available on Liquid Feedback and how the German Pirates made use of liquid democracy. Sebastian Jabusch did his master thesis on that, for example, and he's providing beautiful anecdotic insights into how the system was conceived and how it was introduced. Christoph Klink and his colleagues provide data-based insights into the voting behavior of the pirates. Iris Korthagen and her colleagues describe how the use of liquid democracy went into the decline and discuss the reasons for that. Sadly, also the German pirates stopped using liquid democracy. Now, what's the reason for that? You see, the way they used liquid democracy was often an end in itself. While the party base was offered liquid democracy to engage in discussions on party policies, the outcomes of these deliberations were not binding for the party leadership. Eventually, liquid democracy was relegated to a publicity stunt and it died out just as the pirate party started to decline. But there are three other systems of which there is sufficient evidence that they actually implemented the principles of liquid democracy. There is Civicracy, which has been developed in 2012 at the Vienna University of Technology. It never has been used. Then there is the Google Votes experiment, which ran between 2012 and 2015. In Google Votes, Google employees were using liquid democracy to vote on trivial things such as, for example, which kind of food they want to get served in their cafeteria or which logotype a project would have. Also, no bigger outcome than that. And there is Sovereign, which is being developed since around 2014. And as of 2020, it still seems to be a project that is alive. However, also for Sovereign, there is no evidence that it would have been actually used anywhere so far. So at the end of the day, by 2020, we have evidence of six liquid democracy systems that have been developed, two of which have actually been in real use for a little while. Now, when we try to understand why the systems went out of use or why some other systems haven't been in use at all, then we will always see the same pattern. You see, there is some very strong conservatism ruling this context. You have conservative context, you have conservative ambitions of political stakeholders which fail to provide a space in which liquid democracy could unleash its potential and prove itself as the superior form of democracy it is. Now this brings us back to a very important question. How can liquid democracy actually be used? In a nutshell, there are three different perspectives of how one can utilize liquid democracy. The first is liquid democracy as a voting mechanism. The second is liquid democracy as an evolution of participatory democracy. And the third is liquid democracy as an enabler of a radically new perspective on what democracy can be. So let me describe you now each of those three options. The first option the voting mechanism that is, it's the most generic one. In this option, liquid democracy is taken as a replacement for voting on a certain matter. But there is a big difference between conservative voting mechanisms and voting as it is done in liquid democracy. Conservative voting is a one-time event. People are presented with a range of options to choose from, and by voting, they decide which option they have chosen. In liquid democracy, on the other hand, voting is a continuous process. Now, what does this mean? You remember earlier we said in liquid democracy you can just delegate your power to somebody else and remain passive for the rest of the day, right? And we said 
you can reactivate your power at any time you wish by just stating your decision. If we combine both, what you get is a way of continuously knowing how much power has been accumulated in a group of people that is backing a given proposal at any given point in time. So if this group of people which is backing this proposal has accumulated sufficient amount of power to make the proposal be accepted by the community, then at the very moment the power has been accumulated and the group has stated its decision, we can assume the group has the required backing to make the decision valid. But one thing is very important to be understood here. This instant referendum feature of liquid democracy is not bound to any specific format. The German pirates, for example, bound it to political positions. So the option which they gave their party base was to vote on which political position their party should have on certain matters. By this, they reduced it to a very limited scale and failed to realize the full potentials liquid democracy can offer. And this brings us to the second option on how liquid democracy can be perceived, that is the evolution of participatory democracy. Participatory democracy is when governments encourage citizens to provide feedback on their work. A typical example is if some investors want to build some new skyscrapers and then the government calls upon the uh, citizens to provide their view on that matter, their expertise on that matter. Or, you know, some politician wants to turn a street into a pedestrian area or a parking lot into community space, stuff like that. Now, the conservative approach to engage citizens in matters like this is to have public presentations, to put information online. Maybe there's even some public online forum where people can engage and provide their opinions. Now, this possibility to engage people in conversation is great. Maybe you even find some experts who provide some valuable expertise. But the more people you have deliberating at issues like this, the more buzzy the deliberation gets. Liquid democracy can be used to avoid this kind of buzz. Now, we said that liquid democracy is all about this network in which people are delegating proxies to act on their behalf, right? So, this network is basically about delegating trust. And trust can also be vested in the opinion of others. So, when it comes to participatory democracy, liquid democracy is a great tool to quantify the political weight of those who are expressing their opinions. But the real beauty of liquid democracy lies somewhere else. You see, liquid democracy is not an evolution of conservative democracy. If you look at it just as this new form of voting, then that would be like looking at the automobile as just a fence in your carriage. The automobile turned out to be a crucial enabler for a radically new form of economy. It enabled mass tourism, new forms of logistics, and it literally transformed the surface of the earth. And likewise, liquid democracy can enable us to sync up completely new ways of public governance, completely new ways of democracy. Progressive ideas on how to use liquid democracy to enable next democracy have been thought up already. There is, for example, the concept of the quantum budget, which allows public funding without the requirement of a tax administration. Then there is the concept of non-mediated governance, which makes use of liquid democracy to empower executive officials to act on behalf of a community. Now, all the scientific knowledge which is currently available on this kind of progressive topics has been brought together in my book, Smart City Governance. This book explains not only liquid democracy in more details, but also how the quantum budget and non-mediated governance can be brought together to enable next democracy. The book also provides a thorough criticism on why e-government, as we do it and know it so far, is not a way for a sustainable future. But rather, why e-government as we know it, can create more harm for democracy than it can actually do good for society. Thank you for listening. My name is Alois Polin and I hope I brought some new insights into your life.